This video will describe a process for finding and validating ideas for biotech startups. This video is an overview of the process that we use in the Venture Exploration Project. Subsequent videos will go into more depth into specific components of the process. And obviously this is just one way to find and validate ideas for biotech companies. There's plenty of other things that you can do, but this is just the process that we use for this project. So the core of the process is exploring ideas beyond your PhD research, or any idea really that you've thought about for a long time. In a lot of cases, scientists and technologists who are interested in entrepreneurship initially focus on tech that they develop themselves, which makes a lot of sense, and in some cases this works really well. But that's not the way that most biotech startups are created. And in fact, the statistically, any given academic technology is not necessarily a, going to be a great fit for uh, the venture-backed biotech model. So a quote from Y Combinator co-founder Paul Graham is relevant here. Uh, Paul puts it a little bit bluntly, but the point is pretty important. If you're going to spend years working on something, you think it might be wise to spend at least a couple of days considering different ideas instead of just going with the first thing that comes into your head. You'd think, but people don't. So for more context here, Y Combinator is perhaps the most successful startup accelerator in the world. They funded companies like Airbnb, Dropbox, Reddit, and Twitch. And their motto is, make something people want. And in this essay, in which this quote appeared, uh, Paul explains why he chose that motto for Y Combinator. And the basic observation is that a lot of smart entrepreneurs have to learn the hard way that starting with a good idea is important. Many entrepreneurs, including Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, and Paul himself, worked on failed ideas before starting companies that eventually succeeded. And this idea is important for biotech as well. This is a quote from Nubara Fayan, who is the founder of Flagship Pioneering. We don't do one venture hypothesis, we do several. Why? Because we want to make sure that we don't have the bias of our starting point. Flagship is one of the leading early stage biotech venture funds in the world, and they're one of the pioneers of the biotech venture creation model. They have a very established and successful process for generating interesting biotech startups at scale. And an important part of their process is keeping a healthy emotional distance from a new idea to avoid becoming overly attached to it and thus potentially less willing to be intellectually honest about the idea's weaknesses. One manifestation of this approach is that flagship doesn't even name their proto companies until they're quite advanced. You know, they call them things like VL47 or some non-meaningful sequence of letters and numbers just because they don't want people to associate deeply and emotionally with the ideas. In essence, what Flagship is doing is screening for startup ideas, sort of how you would screen for a drug. And just as you screen many compounds to increase your chances of finding a hit, it makes sense to create and screen multiple startup ideas. And then once you find a hit, you further iterate and refine that to make sure that what you have is real and to develop it into something that's valuable. And that's what the process is all about. So the basic idea is generate venture hypotheses, identify the key assumptions inherent in each venture hypothesis, basically what needs to be true for the business to work, and then test those hypotheses by seeking negative feedback from subject matter experts. So we'll break that down a little bit more in a second, but first let's talk about what exactly a venture hypothesis is. So in its simplest form, a venture hypothesis is a technology that enables you to develop a product to solve a problem. And in the case of therapeutics, that problem is typically an unmet clinical need. If you want to seek venture capital to fund your idea, you also need to have the, the potential of creating a billion dollar company through solving this problem. So some examples here. There's a lot on this slide and I won't go through all of them, but these are just specific examples of prototype venture hypotheses. So these are all therapeutic specific, but the methodology could be applied to any biotech related idea. For example, a uh, synthetic biology application could be developing low cost culture medium to produce affordable cell based beef for vegetarians who miss burgers. The problem is you have people who have chosen to be vegetarian for health or environmental or other reasons, but they miss the taste of a burger. Plant-based alternatives are good, but they don't perfectly replicate the taste and aroma and texture of beef. 
And cell-based meats could potentially address those limitations, but current technology makes it impossible to develop those products at an affordable price. So low-cost culture media might be a way to address that problem of the affordability of cell-based meat. So to add a little bit more color and complexity to this slide, um, this is just meant to break down each of these venture hypotheses into the specific components that we talked about earlier. So one example here to just illustrate this, we'll just take the first one, computationally designed growth factors uh, for validated NASH targets. So NASH is a prevalent liver disease that can ultimately progress to cirrhosis or liver, liver failure. And there are several growth factors that are being developed to treat NASH. And some of these products have pretty decent mid-stage clinical data. However, the data is imperfect. So the idea here is to use new computational tools to more quickly develop proteins that overcome the limitations of the currently uh, current generation of growth factors. So you have your technology, computational uh, tools, your product, which are going to be growth factors to treat your problem, uh, NASH. So back to the process. The first step is brainstorming ideas. So as the quotes we discussed earlier mentioned, it's worthwhile to come up with multiple ideas instead of just focusing on one. Having multiple ideas doesn't just increase the likelihood of finding a good idea, it also decreases your emotional investment in a particular idea and makes it easier to be intellectually honest about the strengths and weaknesses. If you find your idea isn't viable, you just move on to the next one. It's not the end of the world. But you do need to find uh, a way to focus on ideas so you can dig deeper into the, the, the risks. So you need a methodology for picking which idea of a set of ideas to focus on initially. Importantly, you're not committing to a particular idea at this stage. You're just picking one to do more research on. And in a lot of cases, probably most cases, the idea is not going to be perfect at first. And that's fine. The point of the exercise is not is to develop a good idea. It takes a lot of time and work to develop a good idea. It doesn't just emerge fully formed in a moment of genius as a perfect idea. It takes work to get there. You may have heard people say, you want a good idea that looks like a bad idea. I think that phrase was popularized by Peter Thiel, but it's, it's a pretty common expression uh, in the startup world. And the idea there is that it's a pretty competitive world. If there's an idea that looks good and it actually is good, someone else would probably already be working on it or would be better positioned to execute on the idea than a small startup. You know, a big pharma company, a prominent academic lab, or a well-funded venture fund might be in a better position to execute on those ideas, and they are actively looking for them. Obviously, you don't want to find bad ideas, but what you want to find are things that sound like bad ideas, but are actually good ideas when you dig deeper. The point of the next steps of the process are to quickly weed out which bad sounding ideas are actually bad and which are actually good ideas in disguise. So how do you quickly weed out bad ideas? One way is to subject them to negative feedback from experts. So Flagship's approach for doing this is not to go to experts and ask if they think this is a good idea. That doesn't work for a couple reasons. One, if you go to someone and tell them, you know, you've quit your job to work on this exciting startup idea, what do you think? They're probably going to be nice and tell you that it's a good idea. On the other hand, if you're talking to an expert in a related field and ask them to tell you their best ideas, they may be reluctant to, to share their best ideas for you. So what Flagship does is they assert that an idea is good. And they sort of channel the, the latent energy that you see a lot on Twitter to uh, surface the negative feedback that a lot of people are, are very eager to provide if you just entice them to do so. You may have heard of Cunningham's Law, which states that the best way to get the right answer on the internet is not to ask a question, it's to post the wrong answer. And that's essentially what, what Flagship does in this process, and it seems to be fairly effective. As Doug Cole, one of the other partners at Flagship says, people are delighted to give you negative criticism when you say, I can cure lung cancer by doing X. When you position it like that, negative feedback becomes one of the most abundant commodities in the world. And that feedback is incredibly valuable because it can quickly tell you what you don't know and also help you figure out what other people don't know. 
So what exactly, who exactly you're trying to get feedback from? So in this process, we break it down into three different groups of feedback. First, you want to get feedback on the problem that you're trying to solve. Is this actually a real problem? So talk to patients and physicians to learn this. Secondly, will your proposed solution actually work? Is it technically possible? Is it feasible? A great way to figure this out is to survey the literature enough so you can ask good questions and then talk to the academic and industry scientists who are experts in the various technical fields that are relevant for your product. And then thirdly, can this idea make money? So if you're starting a company, you're going to need to raise money, likely from venture capital investors or from pharma companies. And you can do your own homework to figure out whether your idea will be uh, financially profitable, but it helps to talk to investors in pharma to get their perspective as well. So if you do get bad idea or bad feedback, in many cases, you'll hear something that's obvious to others in the field as a deal breaker. So maybe your idea has been tried before and failed, but that study was never published. Or maybe the idea violates some basic law of science in a field that you're not familiar with. Or maybe the problem that you're working on isn't actually that big of a deal. So if you find a deal breaker like this, it's best to just table the idea and move on. Of course, you don't want to rely on just one person's opinion to kill an idea. You know, talk to multiple experts to confirm. But if you do hear consistent feedback that there's something seriously wrong with your idea, just move on to the next one. But in a lot of cases, it won't be so clear. You'll probably hear some feedback that makes you think the idea is bad, and some feedback that's pretty exciting. And in these cases, you just want to iterate and improve the idea as you learn more. Maybe the unmet need is real, and you've identified a part of the technology that seems to be a potential solution, but there's a deeper technical obstacle that you hadn't heard of. In that case, maybe you can change the idea a little bit, or find some other technology to address the issue. Or maybe the risk is real, but it's acceptable given the overall risk-reward profile of the idea. So when you get to a point that you can either handle all of the negative feedback or can accept it as a necessary risk, then you have a solid idea. And that's the point where you can start to test some of the work in the lab and look to raise money. So the goal is to start off from a position of being naive, where other people know things that you don't, to be in a position of having a unique insight, where you know something that other people don't. So that's an overview of the process. Uh, it's, it's much easier said than done, obviously. It's not easy to come up with a very valuable idea that no one else has had before. So not only is it difficult to reach that point, but the process itself can be quite challenging. So here's some common pitfalls and challenges for this approach. One is just not talking to people about your idea. Depending on your background, finding people to talk to and having interviews with them to seek feedback and idea may not be something natural or something that you've done before. It's also a pretty difficult logistical challenge to find experts who are generally very busy, ask them to talk about an idea that to them might seem crazy and to do so without really offering them much tangible uh, in the way of their own self-interest. There's also the psychological challenge of getting a lot of rejection, which you will inev inevitably do when you reach out to people to try to meet with them. A lot of people won't respond to you. A lot of them will be too busy. A lot of people will brush you off. That's unfortunately just the, the nature of this process. Another pitfall is not seeking negative feedback. So a lot of people want to be nice and they don't want to give you direct negative feedback, which is totally natural and in most situations is a good thing. It can also be difficult for people uh, to solicit criticism. It's just not fun to hear people criticize an idea you like, but it's important to seek that negative feedback. On the other hand, you don't want to give up too easily. It can be very tempting when you hear a world leading expert criticize a part of your idea that you hadn't thought of before to think this just won't work. This is just not something that, that I'm cut out for. But in a lot of cases, one expert may have a completely different opinion from someone else. And you need to really think honestly, not just about the weaknesses of your idea, but about the strengths of your idea and the potential weaknesses of other people's feedback. People may be missing something. They may not be clearly understanding what you're communicating to them. They may have their own biases, or they may just be too busy or in a bad mood. 
it's it's hard to balance the line of dismissing ideas that don't seem promising and being persistent and determined to really get at the underlying diamond in the rough. And then the last pitfall is being overly committed to an idea and emotionally invested in it. And when you're overly committed to an idea, it just makes it that much more difficult to seek negative feedback on it and to be intellectually honest with yourself. It's important to remember that if you're working on a startup, it will consume your life for the next several years. And it's better to rip the Band-Aid off and kill an idea that's unpromising at the start than it is to work on something for many years that part of you knows has a severe limitation and an unlikely chance of, of ultimately being as successful as you would like. So the whole point here, I guess, is to talk to people. Do a quick initial triage of ideas on your own, but the goal here is not to become the world-leading expert on every aspect of your idea. You want to find the world-leading experts in the various technical domains and then seek their feedback. You can't think of everything yourself. You can't know everything yourself. And even if you could, you don't have time to do that. And despite a lot of the things we discussed earlier, this can be a very fun process. After you've had a few conversations with experts and gotten up to speed, you'll generally have something to offer them after a few conversations. And it can be really rewarding to have gotten up to speed on an area that you're not familiar with and be having productive, fun, and simulating conversations with experts. And when you do get to the point where you found an idea that initially sounded crazy to other people, but now they're convinced is promising, that is an incredibly rewarding feeling as well. But you won't get there if you don't talk to people. So get out there and do it. So that's an overview of the process that we use in the Venture Exploration Project. In the next video, we'll discuss some specific ways to tackle the first parts of the process, coming up with ideas and initially screening which ones are the most promising.